Good morning, everybody. Good we morning. ask that you please stand and join us. We're going to kick off our service with some music. Um, if we can make our way into the sanctuary from eating donuts. Those were good today. I must admit, I had a little fried croissant, so those are pretty good. All right, let's get into our worship this morning. beginning anytime we can allow Scott to go up and down the piano that's that's what we're here for so <laughs> anything I appreciate that, anything Angela. for him all right welcome it's a little cooler outside hope you all survived another round of storms um, we hope that we just pray that if you are affected that if you need anything definitely reach out to the church let us know uh, but we welcome you in whether you're here in the sanctuary or out online and then, did I see, I see Mary. Is Jim not here, Mary? He's here. Okay. It's his birthday today. So if you see him, make sure you wish him a happy birthday. So um, we are going to slow it down and do a Phil Wickham song called Hymn of Heaven. upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before 
one more. This was requested by DeWitt. Um, he's kind of taken us back to Sunday school days, mm -hmm. and um, you guys are going to know it. I don't even think we need to put words on the screen. So, And, and before we start it, <laughs> we know that as children we come to Jesus and we believe with a childlike heart and as a child he heard this song and he believed he believed upon Jesus and it encouraged him and it motivated him to let his light shine to let the boldness of the Holy Spirit whether he knew that it was the Holy Spirit but let his boldness shine before all men and so Amen. that's the request uh, for this song, Amen. this Tam little preaching light of today mine. or do it? I mean, let's <laughs> let's bring them up. It's a pair. That'd be a great <laughs> duo. All right, amen on that one. All right. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Shine all over the world. Shine, shine all over the world, I'm gonna 
you guys sound great. You may be seated.
only have one child out there, and I don't want to put her on the spot because I haven't met her yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> I'm Susan Heikus. I'm one of the children's ministry volunteers here. So I have a question for you this morning. Who is the greatest? God? You're getting a little ahead of me, but that's okay. <laughs> it's like, do we think about, I'm thinking of a human actually this time. Who's the greatest? Who's the most powerful? Who has the most money? Who's the most famous? Athlete, singer, actor, actresses? Well, one day the disciples were having an argument about who would be the greatest in heaven. So you can imagine how this was going. Who's going to be the greatest in heaven? Well, Jesus pulled the child aside. And this is what he said. This comes from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. He put that child at his level. Think about that. As we go about our days, a child, honest, sincere, humble, a child on the level of Jesus. So let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, I ask your blessings upon these children, that you be with them each and every day. Help them to keep their sincerity, their humbleness, and that we as adults can model them. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Good morning, Bethany. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for all you've been to me and my family. Uh, we've been here for years, and you all have been a real blessing to us. But first of all, let's give a quick hand to Susan Heikis and the Children's Church. Isn't that wonderful? Children's Church at Bethany on the Hill. Good morning. I'm DeWitt Lee Weir III. You've seen me at Bethany for years now, but there may be some things about me that you may not know. I'm a former Sunday school teacher. You know, before you come before God's people, you have to prepare yourself. So before I started teaching the kids, I prayed. I said, Lord, can I just give them that feeling, the one that I was given? Do you all remember that? Just knowing that God was right there. Warmer than any warmth, more comfortable than any couch, just simply there. You could just climb up this side of Daddy and go all across his head and then slide right down into my spot, right in his arms. Just be. On September 27th, 2001, a three-year-old three girl 
came home from Christian daycare. She ran straight up to her room to talk to God about what she did on her birthday. God, guess what I did today? I drew a circle. We started with a pen and a string to practice, and we would go round. But this one, this one I drew without a string. Miss Goldberg said it was a wonderful circle, and she put a big gold star right in the center. See? Tommy said it was not a perfect circle. God, sure, darling, can you draw for me a perfect circle? God said, of course I would. She woke up the next morning and ran downstairs <coughs> and said, Mom, Dad, look, God drew me a perfect circle. Her parents replied, eat your breakfast. You skipped dinner yesterday. <laughs> Matthew 18, 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him, placed them among them, and said, Truly, I say to you, until you change and become like this little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. In the fall of the seventh grade, her math teacher was teaching about circles. Mr. Wiesner said, the formula for the area of a circle is pi r squared. A figure where every point on the curve is equidistant from the center. That is a perfect circle. Uh, to her teacher and said, that may be a circle, but it's not a perfect circle. God drew me a perfect circle. And she showed him her drawing. Mr. Wiesner said scoffingly, I don't know if God drew this for you but it clearly does not meet the definition of a circle, nor is it by any means perfect. She took her paper back, and she left questioning. Why would God draw this for me as a perfect circle? Is, is it perfect? Even I can see its flaws. She shrugged off her doubts and went to confirmation class that evening. The devotional was on Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God and he will freely pardon them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than yours. I 
after class, she showed her pastor the drawing and asked him. I asked God to draw me a perfect circle, and he drew me this. And today I showed it to my math teacher, and he said, of course it's not a circle, nor is it perfect, and commented that my God must have Parkinson's disease, judging from all the little shakes in the drawing. (laughs) Mr. Miller, why do science and math teach me different than what God teaches? Mr. Miller, Pastor Miller, looked at her lovingly and said, math and science come from God and through his church to accomplish God's will and to give him his glory. Pastor Miller went on to explain, the Roman Catholic Church founded the university system in Europe, and that's how modern mathematics comes to us. Roger Bacon, another Catholic scholar, invented the scientific method. The world knows this is true, Roger Bacon was a 13th century English priest, philosopher, science, logician, and Franciscan friar who emphasized the study of nature through empirical observation. There was a long tradition among Franciscans of um, emulating St. Francis of Assisi, their spiritual father, who was a keen observer and admirer of nature. Bacon is credited with creating and formalizing the world's most coherent scientific method out which modern science would have not been created and persists until this day. She took her paper thinking to herself, That didn't answer my question. (laughs) During her senior year of high school, her physics class took a winter field trip to an astrophysics symposium covering the Big Bang, cosmic inflation, galaxy and star formation, the solar system, Earth's geological record, and evolution to modern man. Her teacher was so impressed by Dr. N.D. Tyson, she thought she'd throw them a curveball. She raised her hand and told them, God drew her a picture, and I challenged Dr. Tyson to figure out how it's a perfect circle. He confidently said, I'll take a swack at it, but I'm sure I will only disappoint you. He looked and he said, there is no God, and this is proof. It's not a circle. It has no true center, and even the line in the middle isn't really a straight line. This is just non-science, nonsense. I guess that what they say about our educational standards is true. So she retrieved her paper and shrunk away. (laughs) She went back home to her bedroom and shut the door. Angry and frustrated, she didn't like to look like a fool. She said to herself, I'm smart. I could be an astrophysicist someday. Why would God set me up like this? Why would he let me go up there and embarrass myself? Why would he let an atheist get the best of one of his children? Did I really get this from God? Matthew 13, 10 through 13. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to these people in parables? 
He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given unto you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. She put her picture back up on the wall with the rest of her posters. In the winter of college, just before she graduated, she said, I have learned my lesson. <laughs> she said, I'll keep to myself and I'll keep the hot side hot and the cool side cool. Meaning, what the world teaches about math and science, she'll learn that to get her engineering degree. And she'll quietly go to church and believe what she believes at home. She was shocked to see Cody from her differential equations class at the off-campus uh, local church. He was the most arrogant guy she had ever met. But now he knows how to challenge a professor. <laughs> but today, he was different. He was following behind an associate minister who was even younger than him. She overheard him saying, I know the word and I comprehend their meaning, but I just don't see God in it. And the associate minister pointed Cody to John 14, 9 through 11. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even, if, even after I've been amongst you so long a time, anyone who has seen Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that he is in me? And the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. <laughs> you know it's spring when this crop of young this year's crop of young intellectuals go to show off their chops in on-campus debate. <laughs> she saw Cody and Antosh the two biggest egos in the College of Engineering, going at it again. <laughs> if there's no God, then why is nature organized in ways consistent with the rules of design? Cody went on to say, yes, Darwin got away with some goo, just so happened to turn into a one-cell organism, and in time, random circumstances could turn a one-cell organism into a complex human being. So Antos, you got to admit, with discovery after discovery, we find out that processes on the scale of the universe down to the smallest subatomic particle are finely tuned just to produce life on Earth. Antos replied, yeah, but you see, the multiverse debunks that because there are infinite number of universes. And, and so all possible scenarios play out in separate realities, totally independent and mutually exclusive from each other. That's why we can't detect them so far. Cody said, now that is the worst nonsense 
non-science, garbage theory ever stated. So you're saying if your math is demonstrably wrong and 2 plus 2 equals 7, that somewhere in one or more infinite universes, the math just so happens to evolve different. So 2 plus 2 equals 7? Which makes your erroneous answer here correct? Don't you see why all multiverse movies have horrible plots? She thought, wow, Kobe is stepping out on his faith while I've been retreating into introspection. She smiled, believing uh, being a fly on the wall gave her an appreciation that someone else was on their faith journey too. She remembered when she was bold in the spirit like Cody, uh, but he commanded better debate tactics. <laughs> even though he was just taking baby steps in his walk with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Many were not wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But, Jesus, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Jesus Christ who has become the wisdom of God. That is our righteousness, holiness, redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let, no, let, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And for the first time in a long time, an ease came over and she was at peace. This summer was hot. She'd been working her dream job at Big Aerospace Company for four years now. She drove by the old science center and saw the sign, Tomorrow, the marvelous AI open demonstration. She couldn't help but to grab her old drawing. The AI at the display booth was explaining the machine to the audience. Our new quantum computer, uh, neurological simulator, artificial intelligence, or AI, is the pinnacle of human achievement. All within two cubic foot box, weighing approximately two pounds, about the size and weight of a human brain, except our artificial intelligence has access to all human knowledge through its internet connections, vast storage facilities, scans of ancient texts, and hundreds of algorithms uh, to process data and understand the context like humans do. Simply ask it uh, a question and I will read your response off its display for your answer. She raised her hand. She had to stump man's great machine. But she had learned a lesson, though. She wasn't going to say that God drew it for her. She'd say her father drew it. That's technically not a lie. <laughs> she waited her turn and asked the rep to solve, to, to ask the rep to have the AI solve her father's riddle. My father drew this picture as a perfect circle. How is it a circle? And why is it perfect? The AI rep was proud of his machine. 
we'll take up the challenge. He took the drawing, scanned it into the AI, and asked, how is this a circle, and how is it perfect? Then the machine whirled and flashed and blinked, search, searching to find the right answer in the right context. And the rep went on to explain to the crowd how this is different than the computer searches that you're used to and are familiar with. The AI is not simply comparing shapes to other shapes and formulas to other formulas and checking for a match. No, the AI is deriving from the conversation what the intent of the question is and comparing that to all human knowledge and constructing an answer that will fit the original context of the question. That's why it's taking some time now. Ding! Ah, ooh, we have several answers. Your father did not draw this for you. It's a picture of Earth's orbit from the vantage point of being outside the solar system and above it. But if we rotate it, then we see it's the old picture we're all familiar with. <laughs> the AI says, that's why a person could call it a circle. But only a child thinks that way. It's not perfect. Earth doesn't rotate in the doesn't orbit in a circle. Although it's not perfect, it is exceedingly accurate. In fact, the little wobbles on the spiral and the subtle shaking of the center line allow the AI to calculate the exact dates the graph covers. It begins September 27th, 1998, and continues for 25 years without error until, wait for it, wait for it, today. <laughs> she was flabbergasted. She trembled. She shook. Her face grew faint. Her heart pounded. Then her soul erupted. My birthday! <laughs> she finally understood what made the drawing a perfect circle. It was not about the dots on the page, but a loving God showing a grown woman he had been watching over her life the entire time. He cared about the relationship with a three-year-old girl so much to honor the, her request to show her what God considers to be a perfect circle. The circle was not around the sun, but her journey from a baby in faith to a bold witness in the world to an accepting yet frustrated and questioning adult, finally, to complete the journey today and come into full understanding of knowing God is real, sovereign over the heavens, and each individual on earth. But the AI rep was still talking. Miss, you see, we know your father couldn't have drawn this for you. It's far too accurate. The wobble on the earth is spot on. The center line pits the sun's path around the uh, galactic curve exquisitely. So where'd you get it? Hey, miss, come back. You forgot your paper. She turned and ran out of there on fire with the Holy Spirit like never before. The joy in her heart was her praise. And as soon as she made it to the sidewalk, car jumped the curb and killed her instantly. Jeremiah 9, 
23 through 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. May we bow our heads for the reciting of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, and I believe we're at the part of our service where the choir comes back up. We're going to have you stand and join us for our last song. Once we start this, ones that we do um, that you guys like, and but the message of the song is just perfect. When we asked DeWitt to give us his themes and scriptures, and then Michelle and I go digging for songs, but he did request this, and he was like, you know, circles and cycles and heaven, and we were like... Oh boy, three words. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it. But no, this one, this one, the circles and the cycles of life. Um, th this just sometimes a song just fits perfect. So we hope you enjoy it.
All right. We wish you a blessed week. Go in peace.